when we think about the growth of Los Angeles coming out of the latter part of the 19th century through the years approaching the Great Depression, we don't usually think about brick. Los Angeles is not seen to be a brick city, but in fact, it owes much of its growth and the metropolitanization of the city to that simple building material. Oh Maria, Madre mía, oh consuelo del mortal, ampararme y llegarme a la patria celestial, ampararme y llegarme. People chronicles Mexican migration of the first part of the 20th century. The brickyard at one time in the 20s was the largest brickyard in the world producing, what, 600,000 to maybe a, a million brick a day. All that brick was used to construct the major buildings of L.A. and Pasadena and all the Southern California area. All the big entrepreneurs, like Walter Ruby Simons, would not have been successful if it wasn't for that labor, if it wasn't for... So hand in hand, they, they built, you know, uh, uh, Los Angeles. Hand in hand, they built Southern California. In the late 1880s, when adventurers and entrepreneurs were pushing west by the thousands, Walter Simons went to Los Angeles with his brother Joseph to buy land rich in clay deposits. This new land was to become an extension of the family's 100-year-old brick-making business that had begun in Worcester, England a century earlier. The brothers finally settled on a piece of land on Glenarm Street in Pasadena near what would eventually become the Pasadena Freeway. In all, they would open eight brickyards that over the next several decades would supply bricks, roofing, paving tiles, and chimney block for construction needs around the world. Simon's yard number three, which was their big one, was out in Montebello. It's seen by many people as ironic that there's virtually nothing left there today, but in fact, that's fairly typical of Los Angeles having essentially an amnesiac quality to its past and uh, an ineffable ability to cover up what once was. But when the Simons Brickyard was roaring through the 20s and even into the Great Depression period, it was seen to be the world's largest brickyard. By the turn of the 20th century, brick became the primary building material in Southern California. It was the basic material in the construction of housing, commercial buildings, and the larger, taller buildings of downtown Los Angeles. Los Angeles City Hall, the inner walls are full of Simon's brick. When they redid the City Hall just a few years ago, they had to deal with Simon's bricks. Many of the city libraries throughout Southern California are made out of Simon's brick. Police stations, government buildings were made with Simon's brick. As you walk around certain areas, you look down, there's Simon's brick. In 1904, with business already booming, the Simons brothers decided to purchase approximately 345 acres rich in red clay deposits in southwest Los Angeles, bordering the city of Montebello. The next year, Simons Brick Company No. 3 was established. The Los Angeles area was fast developing. California was no longer the Wild West, but a settled land rich with investment opportunity. All that was required for entrepreneurs to achieve the economic dream was an idea, money, and labor. This was the formula followed by the Simons brothers, who relied on a first-generation Mexican immigrant labor force to enact their vision of building a successful brick empire. The brick people, those immigrants who came from Mexico to work at Simons Brickyard No. 3, literally and culturally laid the foundation for Los Angeles and many other great cities in California and beyond. Migration has always been a part of our history of L.A. And it seems that L.A. has always been kind of like a focal point or a center. People always going through, coming down from the north, from the south, going to the north, right? And also from the east, the, the migrations of, uh, you know, of the people who, who colonized, you know, who set up the colonies, first colonies in the United States. From the east, they came to the west. They kept coming west in L.A., Southern California was one of the sources. There was a demand for labor. There was a lot of encouragement where people wrote to bring their relatives up here. At the sort of beginning of the Simons history in Southern California, there really isn't a border in the Southwest. There's a demarcation on maps, but there's no enforcement whatsoever. 
the few immigration agents there were were not looking for Mexicans to come across the border. They were looking for Asians trying to circumvent uh, either the Gentlemen's Agreement or the Chinese Exclusion Act. Signed into federal law in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was an example of congressional reaction to economic instability and social unrest that manifested itself as racial exclusion on a broad scale. It prohibited the immigration of any Chinese laborers into the United States until its repeal in 1943. Beginning around 1917, the U.S. begins to enforce uh, immigration controls in the Southwest, um, not to necessarily control Mexican migration, but um, as part of a broader concern about European migration. So uh, restrictions that are imposed on European migrants that they have to be literate are sometimes imposed in the Southwest, many times aren't. All of these things change what had been a very open environment up until the you know, first uh, decade of the 1900s to one where there are intermittent restrictions. And the intermittent restrictions are important because they force people who had previously treated the border as something that could be crossed freely to something where they have to consider which side of the border they want to be on. It's not until really the Border Patrol was created in 1924 that one really begins to, to, see, this, to see this enforcement. This is the time of the great Spanish revival. Better Homes and Gardens encouraged homemakers to go Mexican in terms of their, uh, of their home decor. In fact, at the Sesua Centennial of the founding of Los Angeles in 1931, Los Angeles city operators were instructed to the answer of the phone, Buenos Dias, City of Los Angeles. Now, Buenos Dias, City of Los Angeles seems very ironic, but at the same time, they're deporting people. Walter Simons understood that running a 24-hour brick factory required a constant source of dedicated workers. He built a company town to support the non-stop production. As the company town grew, there was a need to ensure safety and order for the residents. Walter Simons appointed Henry Prado sheriff. By all accounts, he wore a star on his chest. Some accounts have him with a gun on his hip. And he was a man who kept order within the yard for the company. And to this day, multiple generations later, the memories of Henry Prado are still quite profound, in part because he was seen to be a fairly fierce and oftentimes a self-aggrandizing figure of social control. As the live-in workforce grew, they became more and more reliant on what Simons provided for them. The Simons Brickyard, as a company town, is a fairly standard one, I would suspect. We had our food there. We had our job there. Our church. Our church. School. Everything was just a close community, just like you'd have an army base. It was our own little city. There was a store they called the Cooperativa on Vail. It was a company store. I think we used to pay the electricity bill. Each house had to pay it. But I think that rent we didn't pay. But the electricity we did. Water we didn't. Simons was a very highly developed company town. While the other brickyards, I don't think, had huge company towns around them. People lived outside of the brickyard. They drove to the brickyard. They lived, uh, they'd, this, I think, that particular, uh, Simon's Montebello, in Montebello, Simon's Brigade Number 3, was the only, only real company town that developed. The people of Simon's embraced celebration just as any community would. Walter's wife sponsored the Simon's Brickyard Band, made up of the more musically inclined residents. In fact, the band obtained so much local notoriety that it was eventually invited to participate in the Rose Parade, twice. Walter Simons even expressed a flair for the theatrical, building an entertainment hall for his workers. And he had a small dance room, and he had pool tables for the men to enjoy on the weekends to go play pool. In 1913, Simons residents constructed Mount Carmel Catholic Church with bricks donated by the company. Father Charles Espelette dedicated his life to Simons. A beloved and indispensable member of the community, he oversaw baptisms, confirmations, and weddings in the community for most of his life. We were born all in the house. One doctor, Dr. Hoffer, and he named all of us Carmen Maria, Virginia Maria, Francisca Maria. 
He liked Maria because <laughs> he put us all in Maria. We were all Maria. The town also encouraged the organization of a men's baseball team and a women's softball team. It has been said that some games became so heated that bricks were thrown. The baseball team produced several notable players, including Fred Haney, the future general manager of the California Angels. It's one thing to think you can explain Simons through research, reading old documents, examining old pictures, etc. It's an entire other operation to try to understand Simons through the memories of the people who lived it. Simons? Simons, you have to live in it to appreciate it. It was a time of depression, so some people needed housing, and it was the lowest rent that they could afford, especially since a lot of fathers had no jobs. Other than the brick people, they had their jobs. I think we had a nice group. People were nice. Because at that time, the people that used to live in Simon, either related or compadres, everybody knew each other. Most of them came from the same place in Mexico. Simons was a second Mexico. Just like a big whole family, you know. Most of them, you know, the parents came from the same town in Mexico. Guanajuato. Guanajuato. Brick making was a dangerous and difficult job. The men labored hard every day, risking their health, breathing the fine red dust that filled the air, and enduring heat that for most would be intolerable. And certainly, compared to what was else was available in the labor market at the time, yes, it was a good job. It was it a perfect job? Absolutely not. Uh, there was, you know, it was a hazardous job. It was a dirty job. The production of brick from clay is a multi-pronged operation that moves from literally digging the clay out of the earth into a whole series of shaping and forming and drying and cooking the brick. A lot of it was manual. That's why they needed a lot of cheap labor, immigrant labor. Magdalena Baltazar was one of the laborers who supported his family with the money he earned making brick. A big steam shovel is loading the soil into the little carts. They dump them on a, on a big, uh, like a belt, and bring the, the soil into the machine. They had like a pusher. They keep pushing the, the soil forward towards the bread. So, so the bread keeps going up and down. Every time it goes down, they, they'll have a mold, and then the, the bread will push the soil into the mold, and then there'll be a man out there taking the pellets and put them up on the racks. In the last uh, summer of my high school, I went to uh, work there also in the, what they call the racas, which is the racks where they, you get the, the pellet with about six wet bricks, and you try to grab them, and, they have shells where you try to put them down and, you know, there was a guy behind me named Henry Sabala and I couldn't do it. I was so, so, so weak then at that time. So I let him go to him and he, after a while he shot, I said, hey, get somebody else. This guy can't do it. I used to work there turning those bricks and I think it was, uh, I think we used to get, we used to get paid uh, something like two or three dollars to do a whole rack, what they used to call the racas. All I remember uh, was my dad making us go over there. We used to have to go follow him over to the big racks where they had all the, the bricks, and we'd just follow him. He'd be turning, we'd be turning, you know, and until he got his section or whatever he was in charge of done, and then we could go play. And then they set them there for about two, three days until they dry up. They load them up a little truck. The mules pull them out to the to kill. It'd be, it'd be fired. When I was a kid, a lot of, a lot of the uh, bricks were melt. They didn't know how to adjust the, the heat, I guess. There were piles all over the place, just in, everywhere. But then they learned something because later on, the, all the bricks, most of the bricks were the same color of uniform. No, no, no waste. The only waste was when they break, when they fall. I worked there like an uh, animal. Winters, summers, the winter is all muddy. You know, just, I mean, I mean, it's, but I mean, you like it, because those years, you know, you live happily, you live there, I mean, with your relatives and friends and all that. There was a lot of work to do in Simons other than just making bricks, and men were just half the story. They worked hard. 
under hazardous, exploitive conditions. Yet women had their place in silence as well. You know, women built the community. Women were the unrecognized labor that held the families and community together. They were their children's first teachers, passing on cultural values and generational traditions. Oh, they worked. They had no hot water, so they had to boil the water to bathe us, to cook, to wash. Of course, they used the scrub boards, of which I still have one. We had chinkas. Mother used to make those chickens in mole, in, in soup and everything. Rabbits. We, we, we had a lot to eat. Women played an extremely uh, vital role at Simon's Brickyard. Uh, they volunteered in the school. They worked in, uh, for the church. Uh, they probably organized the social events. And some people had boarders that lived in a room, rented a room, or a young relative that lived with the family. And they would make lunches for these people. As they went to work, they would pack off their lunches. And when they came home, some of these women also sewed lunches out of their homes. One could diminish their reliance on the company store if they raised their own vegetables, uh, if they had, you know, chickens, if they had their own sort of domestic economy. The mama had to keep things together. The mama was the lady that made clothes, patched the clothes. Uh, a lot of times people made clothing out of sacks, flour sacks. Uh, the mothers had to do all the cooking. You know, it wasn't like today when you get a microwave and pop stuff in. They actually had to grow some of the crops out in the backyard. Historians have said the, that it's the women, you know, sort of hold the glue uh, that keeps the Mexican-American family together. Simons encouraged the workers to grow their own population by setting up the Simons Company bonus baby program. Every baby born earned the family a $5 gold piece. But of course, there's different ways to look at this. Uh, paying, in essence, families that have children is perhaps also a way to build loyalty and build the birth rate to eventually have more workers in that brickyard. And so that's a classic kind of benevolent uh, view um, that's tinged with the needs of the brickyard in terms of labor. Domestic economies helped provide a feeling of wealth to many financially unwealthy families. We were wealthy, but I think our wealth came in a different way. Well, we were a very close family. We believed in God. And uh, I think we were pretty happy. <laughs> there was a saying that my mother used we were poor, but we were clean. They didn't uh, think of it as being a bad situation. No depression didn't bother us. No bother. And everybody was in the same boat. They all had the same homes, or you, we call them shacks now, but, but they were homes then for us. So that was the beauty of growing up in Simons. We were poor, but didn't know it, and we enjoyed every bit of it. Despite the Brickyard's economic success and seemingly utopian company town community, it stands as one of America's greatest examples of segregation and oppression. The Simons Brickyard story is, is, on the one hand, a case study of the rise of Los Angeles in the late 19th and early 20th century and the ways in which that rise is fundamentally related to race relations. Although many Simons residents remember life in Simons as a positive and happy time, they still had to deal with direct and de facto discrimination and racism. Life outside that brickyard was harsh and racially antagonistic. There are segregated theaters. Uh, there are uh, segregated pools, uh, even playgrounds. All Simon's residents had to attend Vail, the Mexican school. I remember getting wrapped over my knuckles with a ruler for, for six in Spanish. You couldn't speak a word of Spanish. Every so often, it just, I used to do it, and I would be sitting on the bench. Go to the office, somebody reported me, of course, and I would say, and now, and now you are required to take Spanish. If you have a job and you're bilingual, good for you. If you don't, you don't have a job. Isn't it something? And I used to be sitting on, 
on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the bench there because somebody snitched on me that I said something in Spanish. Simon's students were profiled exclusively as workers in training with no other possibilities for advancement. The school that they had was not to prepare young men and women to go off to college or to go off into a, a trade. Those students who went on with their schooling were automatically placed in shop and home economics classes. Who was to be, you know, a literate, worker in the factory. More overt versions of the racism and discrimination prevalent in schools were also practiced aggressively in the community of Montebello. They didn't sell houses in Montebello to same uh, to Mexicans. Now when people when you were walking by they look at you as a you stink or something. <laughs> if you went to certain restaurants, they would have signs. No dogs or Mexicans allowed. My aunt worked in Uptown Whittier at the Penn Hotel. She was a maid, but she couldn't stay at the Penn Hotel because they had a sign, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. Prevailing discriminatory attitudes outside of Simons and other Mexican communities kept Los Angeles heavily segregated for many years. Mexicans couldn't use the public swimming pool except on special Mexican days. Well, locally, if they went swimming at Montebello, there was only certain days where the Mexicans could go swimming. But I'm going to tell you a little story. There was a plunge in Montebello, and uh, people for Simons were not allowed to go there, use it. So the older fellows, they would go get as red as they could from the dust, <laughs> from the brick, from the molino. And at night, they would go jump the fence at the plunge and leave that blue water red. <laughs> and they couldn't figure out how they had jumped because that fence was high. But the guys found a way, and they would sneak in there and, and swim and leave the water nice and red for them. Today, if you look at it, uh, what we know today, we wouldn't call it an ideal place to live or an ideal situation for a worker. I think World War II changed that. World War II broke out and the men from Simons went to war. The, the men of Simons, the young uh, uh, you know, fellows of Simons went and participated in the war, just like many, many, many other Mexicanos and Latinos did. And they did it proudly. The men came back from war having experienced new worlds and new ways of being. They had lived lives of change and were ready to continue doing so. As the young man that went off to war came back, they had been exposed to things that were different. And they saw that as being time for a change. But you know, during the war, they changed everything. You know? people, people got, well, something else too that happened that improved relations with the people. With, during the depression, the government started working, putting out jobs for the men, for the people. They used to call it WPA. They used to have people digging dishes, maybe three, four hundred people at the same digging one day. And they had all kinds of people, black, white, anything. So people got kind of used to mixing together. But I think that's where the, the integrating started, where people were together. The Long Beach earthquake of 1933 had a profound impact on the brick business in greater Los Angeles. Simons tries to stay ahead of this, Walter Simons, and perhaps some of his employees, by trying to manufacture factor a brick that is earthquake resistant. So they start to, to throw iron bars in the middle of the bricks to reinforce them. Seems like a reasonably, reasonably good idea. So it's essentially rebar through brick. But nonetheless, the brick industry had taken a real blow. Also, the Simons Company had proven somewhat unable or unwilling to diversify management. And so the Simons family is still in charge as the principals, particularly Walter Roby Simons, age. And perhaps had they made other management decisions, the brickyard may have been able to withstand its eventual collapse a bit longer. By the early 1950s, the handwriting's clearly on the wall that the Simons Brick Company is failing. And certainly by the mid-1950s, after Walter Simons has been removed from the scene by death, the Simons brickyard is sputtering along. As he got sick and he was put into a sanitarium, 
Uh, there was really nobody taking care of the plant. Things were being run by his wife as best she could. But eventually the county health department came in and declared the housing a substandard. And people eventually moved out. And then there was a group of industrialists backed up by the Santa Fe Railway called the Central Manufacturing District. And they bought the property from the estate. And then it was subdivided down and made into an industrial area. And none of the street names that coincide with Simons are there anymore. You have different street names, so people can't relate to that unless you grew up in the area and know some of the history. Only place you'll see the name Simons is either on a brick or on the Simons underpass on the five freeway. The the sheer power of the Simons brickyard, which in fact paid fairly well, given the labor economics of the day, meant that many many Mexican origin families had some relation to the Simons brickyard. Simons brickyard number three at Simons, California represents the chapter of California history that is all but lost, except in the memories of those who lived and worked there. To remember and retell the story of Simons is to pay homage to the many lifetimes of labor that contributed to the physical structure and communal foundation of 21st century American society. These stories show us that we're not so different after all. We all go through the same kind of situations, right? live the same, the same ways, uh, have the same, many of the same problems. Uh, they were all really one huge, uh, in a sense, familia. I think it's history, and I think it should be to told how these people came and work here and contribute to this country. It's not only the bricks, the legacies are in the buildings, but also in the generations of the descendants of the brick people. To me, it's like um, a detective story. It's like a mystery. You're trying to solve this mystery. It's almost like a puzzle. You're trying to put all the pieces together. And there's so much raw material that it's out there. And you're trying to refine this into a story, and a story that hasn't been told. Oh, Maria, Madre Mia, oh, Consuelo del Mortal, Ampararme y llegarme a la patria celestial. Ampararme y llegarme a la patria celestial. Con el ángel de María las grandezas celebrar. Transportados de alegría sus finezas publicar. 